All right, I think we can get started. Um, wonderful. A warm welcome to all of you. I hope um, all of you and your loved ones are safe and well. Um, I'm Vijay Vishwanathan. I'm the Associate Dean of the IMC Department at Medill, and I'm also an Associate Professor here. This is truly a challenging time for all of us, and I don't say that lightly. Um, I truly believe we are at a point of inflection as marketers and society figure out how to work with each other and also with technology. At Medill, we are constantly looking forward, scanning the market for emerging trends and how markets and society overall are responding and reacting to efforts undertaken by brands and marketers. This is a time when we need more conversations, more exchange of ideas, so that we can work together to unearth the truth and make a positive impact on society. In this spirit, I'm really happy to kick off the first event organized by the IMC department, and I'm really honored to welcome our guests from William Blair, Laura Coy, and Tyler Glover. They will be talking about the growing importance of ESG, uh, which is really becoming an important issue today. I'm also really grateful to my amazing colleagues, Professors Nancy Hober and Ernest Duplessis, the entire middle staff team, in particular, Stacey Simpson and Matt Schrock. So I hope you have a wonderful time. We have more events for you scheduled later this fall quarter, and we'll be sharing that information with you in the days to come. So Nancy, Ernest, I'll hand over the event to you. So um, I'm going to, uh, I'm Nancy Hilber, and I'm going to um, ask my uh, colleague, uh, Ernest, to please introduce Laura Coy. Oh, wonderful. So good evening, everyone. I'm an associate professor uh, in the IMC program, as well as a graduate of the IMC program. Uh, it is wonderful to be able to introduce one of our esteemed guests on tonight, and that would be Laura Coy. Uh, Laura is the director of a philanthropy strategy and VP of the William Blair and Company Foundation. Laura lead, will, leads William Blair's community investment programs, which really includes philanthropy, matching gifts, volunteerism, and corporate social responsibility. I had the privilege of knowing Laura uh, back at WW Granger, where she served as the senior manager of our CSR programs. Uh, and her work there was really pivotal and foundational to helping us shape the integrated CSR programs that even today are alive and well. And so Laura, we welcome you. She's a graduate of U of I as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. And I'd like to uh, welcome Tyler uh, Glover who works um, closely with advisors and clients in portfolio design and implementation of investment policy, asset allocation, and investment solutions across traditional and alternative asset classes. As the head of the consulting services group at William Blair, he and his team are dedicated to serving private wealth clients. Uh, Tyler joined William Blair at Private Wealth Management in 2014. And previously he had held um, uh, retail and institutional distribution and consulting roles at Calamus Asset Management. Tyler is a CFA charter holder and Chicago CFA Society member. He also serves on William Blair's Retirement Plan Investment Committee. He's a treasurer for Ronald McDonald House of Chicagoland in Northwest Indiana and serves on the organization's Board of Directors and Finance Committee. Tyler earned his BA and MBA from North Central College. We welcome you, Tyler, uh, to this event. So Thank you. Let me, continue, uh, let me continue by um, giving an agenda for the meeting. We're going to speak for, uh, not speak, we're going to be a Q&A session for about 30 minutes. And then we're going to, um, uh, give you a chance to ask questions. Uh, we're going to ask you to please use the Q&A button uh, for any questions as we proceed through the event. And um, with that, I'm going to kick it off with a question for Laura. 
I wonder, Laura, if you could please describe your job at, at William Blair and how important ESG is at William Blair. Thank you, Nancy. And again, it's a pleasure to be here with both you and Ernest and, and everyone at Northwestern. I think we share institutional appreciation for this notion of purpose and ESG. Um, William Blair, as many of you may know, is a global asset management and investment banking firm. Um, you know, my role, I have the honor of what Ernest outlined, which is leading the firm's philanthropic activities, um, our employee engagement, our um, matching gifts programs, our board development initiatives, and our global signature grants programs. Um, and I also have uh, the honor of helping our clients who are philanthropically inclined think about their capital. So it's a little bit twofold. One is how our clients might be giving money away and how effective our employees and clients can be in that pursuit. Um, and then we'll be talking a little bit about how they align their assets to um, the same way that they make a difference philanthropically in, in the management of those assets. Um, I, I think it's interesting when you, th when you ask the question how important ESG is, I, I've seen this great evolution over the past decade. Um, it's always, I would say, a priority of a particular audience, whether that be an employee of the firm, um, a leader who really sees the importance and value of ESG and the clients. Um, but, but I feel like many companies like William Blair are in this unique uh, situation right now where it's a combination of each. So we have a workforce, I think it's 50% um, of our non-partner workforce are actually millennials and, and they're prioritizing this and they wanna see companies with purpose and they wanna activate within their companies, particularly in this past year. Um, you have clients who are looking at ESG and, and what it means to them and, and pushing the envelope a little bit and, and, and asking really good questions. We'll talk about that tonight. Um, and then you have leaders who are working together, whether that be as, at an executive level um, a diversity level or just amongst um, their departments and how to prioritize ESG. So considering those three audiences, Nancy, it's, it's, it's a really important pursuit in corporate America today and, and at William Blair in particular. Well, thank you. Uh, Tyler, could you please describe what you do at William Blair uh, Private Wealth Management in the ESG arena? Sure, absolutely. So again, Tyler Glover, uh, very happy to be here with you all this evening. I, I lead what we call our consulting services uh, business inside of private wealth management at William Blair. Um, in, in our group, uh, amongst a number of other things, as it relates to ESG in particular, uh, investment consulting and research. So one thing that, that I think is particularly important and relevant in the ESG arena is investment policy. And so the way that I would think about that is really developing an investment framework. It's, a, it's more or less a roadmap for, for clients to follow. And uh, as Laura had already mentioned, I think that the one thing that we've seen and continue to see, which I think is fascinating, is really this development of aligning purpose. And, and for us, that's priorities, values, uh, initiatives, with how capital is invested. And I think that's uh, very exciting. And for us, um, everything we do is, is very much customized. And I think the thing that's interesting as we've seen um, the ESG field evolve more broadly is uh, for one, the ability to have transparency and insight both into businesses and investment strategy, and then really develop something that is uniquely suited to a, an investor. And in private wealth management, our, our predominant client base is uh, individuals, families, business owners, and, and nonprofits. And, and so for us, I, I very much enjoy getting to see those nuances because I do think that in ESG in particular, which we'll talk a little bit more about, we kind of see this space as a continuum that really began with more um, what we'd call like negative based screens where you'd be not investing in certain sectors or companies or uh, themes uh, to more of an integrated holistic approach. And so for our group, uh, just to summarize, Nancy, we kind of think of our team as, a, uh, as an investment consulting resource, a research resource. We work very closely with our financial advisors and end clients really across uh, an array of, of client types. So I hope that's helpful. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, Laura, I'm going to uh, go back to you and ask, can you give some quick examples of what you uh, um, mean by ESG? Uh, we assume everybody's talking from the, with the same knowledge, but I wonder if you can also give us what exactly that means. Yes, well, welcome to the world of acronyms. We have CSR and ESG, and <laughs> we'll probably throw some more out there. Um, but ESG is technically a framework around environmental, social, and governance factors and priorities. Um, corporate social responsibility, we find to be the practice and reporting of that framework. Um, I'll talk a little bit about each one, Nancy, but, but I do kind of lead into that with um, a, a notion of materiality. So each company is going to have a little bit of a different flavor or approach to ESG, depending upon uh, their consumers, uh, the products or services they provide or manufacture, um, and their practices, and, and to some extent, whether they're public or private, where they are in the world geographically, et cetera. Um, but, but to summarize a little bit, in, environment, of course, is our environmental footprint. And um, if you think about materiality, a manufacturing company is going to have a much larger um, impact uh, on, a, on the environment, perhaps, than a financial services company. It doesn't mean that a financial services company doesn't have an environmental footprint, but they're going to perhaps be a little bit different in that materiality sense. Um, what is the, the carbon uh, input that companies are, are placing in the world, whether that be through the products and services that they manufacture or the people that are flying um, around the, the, even at William Blair, we look at things like the, the paper utilization, um, the consumable products that we use. Um, social is more of the work that I'm personally in uh, relative to, are we good corporate citizens? Um, do we treat our employees fairly? Are we prioritizing inclusion and diversity? Are we investing in our communities to make them better and stronger and resilient? Um, and then the governance piece is, is kind of where the conversation and I would say basis of ESG started. Um, and a lot of this is, is, is what you're all learning about relative to board governance. Um, are there independent thinkers on the board or representatives? Um, nowadays, I think governance is actually getting really interesting relative to cybersecurity and customer um, confidentiality and client information. Um, and, and again, I, I, I'll use another, <laughs> another acronym, but SASB, which is a sustainability accountable, a sustainable accountability board, they have a really great materiality framework that I can send a link for because you can actually take a look at different industry verticals and get a sense for those priorities with ESG that are highly material to their business. But those are just a few examples, Nancy, of, of on a high level when we're talking about ESG, some of the um, indicators uh, and, and issue areas that we're looking at. Um, that's, that's terrific. I'm gonna turn now to Tyler and say, um, what trends are you seeing in ESG and what do you think is driving them? Sure. It's a great question. And um, I would say for one, uh, the level of customization and an ability to customize, which I think, frankly, we're still in early innings uh, on. I think that um, for one, there is a level of need and expectation from, from investors and clients to have the ability to customize strategies that are specific to them, meet their needs and priorities. And when I say customization, I mean, it's, it's a very broad term. I think that having the data and having the transparency to understand uh, uh, a company's structure and what is material, I think Laura's example of, you know, if you look at environmental, social, and governance, um, we're able to get very granular within those specific categories. And the, the data that's available, for instance, with, with you know, public businesses, I think continues to take leaps and bounds from wh where it may have been at one point in the past. So uh, where I see or where we would see customization going in the future is really being able to you know, understand beyond just the typical investment objectives uh, and constraints of an investor, understand what's important to them from a, pur from a purpose and prioritization standpoint, and then, and then really tailor a portfolio that's specific to them. Uh, and, and just to give you know, one example, um, 
to Laura's earlier point um, on the E, S, and G, I think that from a fundamental investor standpoint, one could argue that something like govern governance has always been a critical factor. I think if anything now, you know, the level of transparency that we're seeing in each of these areas, um, as well as just, you know, the backdrop of the world we live in and, and what's going on around us is really, you know, pushing this forward as something that people are, are conscious of. And uh, I think there's more opportunity for education, consultation to really help move this forward. Well, that's that's very helpful. Laura, maybe you can also uh, weigh in on how companies are trying to work with you and others to improve uh, their operations in these areas. Yeah, and I love, Nancy, I love that word improve because I would say, you know, to Tyler's point, 10 years or so ago, it was really transparency um, and publicly traded companies in particular. I think the statistic now is more than 90% of publicly traded companies produce corporate social responsibility reports. And even if I look back, you know, we were kind of joking when we were preparing for this, you know, that Granger's first corporate social responsibility report was, was pretty bare bones, but, but was a start, right? Um, and if you look at uh, their, their CSR report today, it's very robust. Um, there's goals, there's measurement, um, there's an appreciation, I think, in some elements where there's challenges. Um, so I, I think what's interesting is this journey. And, and I do think as um, consumers, investors, we've got to be a little bit patient with companies who are new to ESG and CSR because it takes a lot of time to collect data, uh, to evaluate data, to get people comfortable with what data you're gonna disclose externally, to set goals around that data. If you look at all the rating agencies that are out there from you know, the sustainable development goals to Bloomberg, to um, both activist investors, and I would say pro-activist investors that are looking to invest in companies that are doing well in this space, um, I think there's an appreciation for this process. Um, I think I think where we can and we have been particularly helpful with our client base in the corporate finance side are those companies that are preparing to be public, and 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 they might have really good programs. They might be sustainability focused and founded, but to understand those fund fundamentals of preparing to tell the world and to showcase um, both I think strengths and opportunities in the ESG space has been a great opportunity for William Blair in particular within that business of helping those companies prepare to be public. Um, I think we're seeing some great progress on the, the private company side as well. William Blair, of course, is a privately held company. And I think what's most important to us is walking the talk. So as we develop these products and services to customize and help clients make investment decisions, it's very important for us to maintain the same rigor, accountability, and focus on ESG internally as we are as we help our clients. So a, a couple examples there, I think, bet between William Blair and, and the pre-IPO in particular. Um, but, but thank you for bringing up the word improve, because that's, that's ultimately where good companies that are focusing on this really want to get to, which is a reduction of carbon, um, stronger governance, and the prioritization, if you look at right now, um, of investing in and focusing on inclusion and diversity. Um, thank you. Uh, Tyler, um, I know William Blair has done a, a good job of, of uh, developing ESG um, investment capabilities and, and resources. Can you give some examples of how you, um, uh, how um, uh, this lets you define what's material? For different uh, in industries? Absolutely. So the one thing that I think is particularly important uh, in this conversation is that we, we really try not to start with a solution and work backwards, but rather the other way around, ask questions and have that conversation and then um, collaboratively build the solution. And so some things that we've been focused on as an organization is really building a, out a platform and building capabilities to deliver that experience. And, and for us, that means having a holistic set of resources. So uh, an example of that would be, and I'll kind of bucket this into three specific areas, in our uh, investment management organization, the work that they're doing on as part of a fundamental research process. So the same way that understanding the qualitative and quantitative aspects of a company is important before making an investment decision, also understanding the ESG framework and some of the considerations that we're talking about here today. 
as it relates to things like um, investment product, for instance. So this can this can span from um, you know mutual funds, alternative investments, other investment products. We really try in the same way that we're doing you know very much deep dive research on those investments from a performance and qualitative standpoint, understand their philosophy, embedded resources, really how they go about making decisions, uh, measurement processes. And then finally, the third bucket, I would say is just to help inform decision making and not only decision making, but ongoing uh, monitoring. So we have a, a suite of resources that help with um, analytics in that regard. So you know, I mentioned kind of the um, environmental, social and governance silos. I mean, we're, we're actually able to go in and look at uh, an investor portfolio across all of those and have metrics to help inform those discussions and understand, you know, where our risk and where are opportunities for improvement. So I know that's, that's kind of a long winded answer, but I do think that this is a particularly complex and again, I think, you know, highly customized arena. And so what we've tried to do is continue to evolve and grow our capabilities to really serve our clients well. Thank you. Um, so uh, Laura is vice president of the William Blair Foundation. How is ESG um, manifested as you select companies to become part of the part of the portfolio? Can you give any examples of um, how the board thinks about the ESG filter when considering a company? Yes, and I think that's uh, you know it's a, it's a great kind of evolution. If you all think about philanthropy in the past, it's really, people really looking at the money you were giving away. Um, and foundations do have a 5% minimum distribution requirement. So it's always been a little bit of a balance. You want that corpus of invested assets to really perform so you have more money to give away. Um, but over the past few years, foundations in particular have been having really good conversations around something they're calling the 95%. So if you're managing, and this is just an example, because we give way more than the 5% minimum distribution requirement away, but if you look at that 95% of the corpus that's invested and compare that to the 5% that you're giving away in very high impact grant making, um, supporting nonprofits and organizations, you could start to think about how together, you know, all, cap all that capital has impact. So a few years ago at the board level, we said, listen, there's so many great um, analytic tools out there, many of which Tyler mentioned. Let's apply this to, to our own corporate portfolio. Let's look at the equities in our portfolio and see how they're performing. Are they performing at a level that we're comfortable with, right? So um, MSCI in particular, um, as many of you may know, has a great ESG um, capability. Uh, we, we overlaid the MSCI ESG screen on our foundation portfolio. Um, and we did two things. We said, overall, how is this doing, right? Like I mean, you can compare hundreds of equities and, and kind of go into each one, but is it performing to a level that we are comfortable with standing by? Are these good corporations that are within our foundation portfolio? Um, and then we, we started to take it on the individual level. Where are we seeing some pockets? And we were kind of managing to a triple B right, which is a, a good kind of industry standard relative to um, uh, investable, you know, good quality type of equities. Um, are there some pockets in there that uh, an individual company may not perform, be performing well and what's going on? So to, to Tyler's point, you can really get granule to kind of understand what, what's going on. And this year, it was interesting, there was one company that we had a, a very good conversation about um, where we felt that um, while it was below the score we were looking for, that there were some trends leaning towards that company in all earnestness um, improving and, and obviously taking uh, ESG seriously. So we decided to leave that equity within the foundation portfolio. Um, but it's been an incredible experience to use our own foundation to kind of test uh, these products um, and take these considerations and have board level conversations both holistically as how the equities are performing relative to ESG and then and pulling out some of those individual companies who, who may or may not be performing on levels that we would be comfortable with. And just so you can help people who may not be quite as familiar, uh, what does MSCI stand for? Oh, I knew you were gonna ask me that and I was trying to figure out how to get over. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Nancy. Okay, I will find that out. It's the, I know it's the Emma. Uh, Tyler, do you know? <laughs> right. 
Yeah, I, I believe now it, it's just strictly MSCI. It was formerly uh, Morgan, Stanley Morgan Stanley Capital International. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for saving me there. Yeah, yeah. got it right. <laughs> so, uh, Tyler, um, how have the employees of William Blair re reacted to, to your efforts? And where is the company ahead? And where are there opportunities for it to improve in this area? If you were looking at at uh, William Blair making recommendations to it, what would you what would you give them stars for? And what would you say? Come on, you got to do a little better here. Yeah, yeah. It's a thank you. It's a fantastic question. I think that in a lot of ways we we think of it as a journey. I mean, we 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 authored and put out a piece, our journey to a sustainable future. So I do think that we're in the midst of that as an organization. I think where we've made strides is in awareness, having the conversation, building out capabilities, and I think really, again, trying to d deliver for, for our clients. I think that where uh, we and the broader financial services industry still have an opportunity and I think work to do in terms of progressing on that journey is um, educating ourselves, educating clients. Uh, Laura, Laura had mentioned earlier, I kind of think of the level of shareholder engagement that's taking place right now in the industry as you know it's a level of activism in, in having those discussions and i really think you know where folks are investing their capital making sure that there is that alignment and i think that there's an expectation that the bar will continue to be raised in terms of both disclosures and transparency as well as just you know how, how folks act and make decisions so i think if anything if i just had to summarize on, on where we think there's a continued opportunity here it's uh, to continue to expand the knowledge base and, and to have those conversations and being able to lead those discussions. And I think one uh, clear example is just when you look at um, surveys across the industry, for instance, in the, the high net worth uh, arena, that there still is a gap between, I think, the level of interest or potential interest in folks investing, whether it be through an ESG or thematic or other lens, but having that alignment in, in capital and their investment strategy. Uh, with where, with where those dialogues are actually happening. So again, I think like being more proactive and having that educational conversation is an opportunity in financial services. And, and how have your employees reacted uh, to the work that you're doing in the ESG area? Have you had any, any re reaction, any pushback or any people who wanna get involved with you? Sure. I, yeah, I have a thought on that. I don't know, Laura, if you were gonna say something there. No, go ahead, I'll follow up. Sure. Yeah, I, I think one thing that um, you know has, has kind of been front and center historically as it relates to you know ESG or, or SRI, socially responsible investment strategies, is is there from a from an investment purist standpoint, is there some type of a sacrifice from a potential investment outcome standpoint? So meaning, in, if I invest in this way, if I'm restricting certain companies or industries, or if I'm missing some opportunity in a certain area, am I giving up? Uh, on an investment opportunity, will my returns be lower? I think, you know, generally speaking, what we found, and, and you'll know, we'll continue to see more work on this, is that you can in invest with that level of alignment and, and uh, engagement and still perform very well from an investment standpoint. So I think in some ways, you know, some of that, I, I would call it more antiquated thinking of if I, if I um, you know, integrate some of these things, I'm going to give something up or I'm going to have a, a lower potential return stream. Um, I think we're overcoming some of that. So if anything, I think that's one thing that we'll continue to, to see work and discussion on. And then, um, you know, finally, Nancy, I would just add, we've been working on from, um, from an, an education standpoint, we, we've done some series around um, ESG training and education inter internally, where we'll pick a topic and spend, you know, 45 minutes or an hour and just present on the types of things that we're talking about here today. And I think that's been uh, effective as well. And Laura, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I, you know, I would say um, in the world of ESG, and William Blair in particular, I'll share the, the white paper that we put together a couple of years ago on our journey. I think when our employees realize that this is something that's integrated holistically in what we do versus a set aside product or service, um, they, they, as they can really see that, okay, I'm integrating ESG into my job. Someone's not asking me to do something extra. This is an additional perspective or analysis that we're going to incorporate into the fundamental analysis that we're already doing on companies, or, um, you know, this is a process that we can take to get to know our customers better. 
So I think the uniqueness of our perspective of integrating it holistically has, has really helped our employees come along. I think if anything, you know, our employees are very eager to get more involved, whether that's through our employee resource groups. Um, each of our offices has a working group that's helping us think through how we support our communities, how we prioritize IND, how we connect with clients on these topics. So um, I, I've been I've been both um, uh, impressed with and also um, really excited for the future because of that kind of holistic integration and interest from employees of participating in our ESG programs. That's fantastic. Um, and uh, I know um, oftentimes in order to be successful, you have to have a, uh, a top, your top leadership has to be involved. Would it be fair to say that that is what you, what you have at, at William Blair? Absolutely. I mean, when I first came to William Blair, I reported to our CFO and he is unlike any other CFO. I, you know, I, I kind of expected some of those questions that, that Tyler um, you know, kind of posed relative to the social and financial balance. And it's not, it's not that case at all. It's, it's, I, I think, you know, on the governance side, leaders are really understanding what it takes um, to, to be a strong institution. Um, whereas 10 years ago, it was very obvious that if there's a break in your supply chain, that's going to cause some significant business risk, right? Um, the training that Tyler mentioned, I think, uh, in the boardroom and with employees has been really effective. And then, yes, I mean, it, it's, it's really inspiring to work for a company where all of the leaders are really embracing its importance, but also see the value. So whether that's a talent value that we know that this is something we need to be prioritizing to attract next generation talent to our firm, to this is something that from a values-based perspective, this is really important, or this is a business opportunity. And to compete with companies and firms that are prioritizing this and bringing this to market in innovative ways, we need to be there. So I think they could each have a little bit of a different perspective, but yes. Um, and I know, I don't, I, I think there's a lot of companies that are bringing those three considerations to bear when prioritizing ESG at the C-suite level. Um, now I'd like both of you guys to, to think about and weigh in on, on, on the question. Is there a role or job opportunities in the ESG field for students in our program, in the IMC program? And what skills are companies looking for when they hire, hire people for these kinds of roles? I would, I would just start there and then I'll hand it to you, Laura, as well. Uh, I, I do think that um, there will continue to be opportunities in the field. So for one, I think uh, data and data management, uh, you know, we mentioned earlier just the amount of you know, transparency and disclosure uh, metrics that are being put around uh, ESG impact and, and just more broadly on the topics we've outlined. So I think that would be one uh, certainly that will continue to see growth. And then I also would say that from a... Um, a marketing and positioning standpoint that that will continue to be uh, an area of opportunity as well. And the reason that I would say that's particularly relevant in, as it relates to ESG is there is uh, there is a focus on being able to educate, articulate, and tell that story um, that I think is in, in some ways you know more complex than maybe your uh, just traditional financial considerations uh, as, as it relates to what we do. So those are a couple of things that, that come to mind. And I think that, frankly, there are other things that we're not even yet aware of that are going, are going to come to bear that we're going to see evolve in the next five, 10 years. So uh, I think it's a space that will continue to see uh, growth. There's been a pretty substantial, substantial amount of growth from an awareness standpoint, from an asset standpoint. It's, it's been a measurable move forward, and I would expect that to continue. And Laura? Yeah. Yeah, Nancy, I, I, I would uh, dovetail a little bit on the, the data piece. Obviously, I sit within the brand marketing and communications function. Um, so looking at data, understanding data, analyzing data, just like we are for the companies that we're looking at and covering. Um, investor relations, obviously, is an area of, of growing ESG interest and activity. 
Um, and I think, you know, business, understanding the business. And I'm going to, I'm going to point Ernest out here because he was a great mentor of mine who, who told me, Lord, get to know the business, um, be in the business, understand the business because that business alignment and that materiality of ESG on your business and making that correlation, um, is so valuable. So I, I think those are three areas and, and they can be different types of positions. You could be within a communications function. You could be in private wealth management, um, but those are at least three competencies that that we're really looking for, and I think the field is in need of. So, look, uh, Ernest, let's open it up now for for uh, the Q and A from our audience. Absolutely, and we would encourage you guys to put your Q and A in the Q and A box, and we'll get to it. And as we scan through, try to bring the the light questions together. First of all, Tyler and Laura, thank you so much for. Uh, participating on tonight. I've enjoyed your comments and really, uh, I think you guys have laid a great foundation for the questions we're about to get into. Uh, and I very much appreciate the part of your comments that says, look, we're on a journey. We all know that this ESG thing is not a fad. It's not going away. It's a powerful trend that's coming in. I think for many of us on the line today, we're just trying to figure out where are we in that journey uh, and really have a realistic expectation around that. Uh, so let me ask a couple of foundational questions that pivot into questions that our colleagues are asking us on the line here uh, and really gets to the nitty gritty of, OK, guys, where are we really? So, you know, I have a colleague out there that asked the question, Candy Lee's on the line, and she says, how does return on investment get prioritized within the social good? So, OK, the 800 pound gorilla in the room is, is this the nice to do stuff and it's around the periphery and it's fluffy or look, is this meaty? Is it here to stay? How does that get prioritized? Who wants to go first, Tyler? <laughs> uh, uh, I knew so, I put a hand grenade out there. That, that's, it's, it's, that, that, that's a hard one. Laura, I'll defer to you and then, and then add if I can. Yeah, I think, you know, Ernest, I used that example about the supply chain earlier. I, we do believe that com companies that are fundamentally incorporating ESG um, are solid companies. They're performing well. And there's a lot of reports. I don't have them in front of me to cite, but we can surely send them that companies that are scoring high relative to ESG are high performing companies. They're companies whose boards are engaged and they know what's going on. It's companies that do have good human rights policies and monitor their, their supply chain. And we use the Bangladesh example a lot of, of this. This was an unwatched supply chain and the cost on the business was huge. These consumer brands that were part of that unfortunate disaster. You know, companies who can attract talent and, and bring in high performing, diverse um, leaders within their firm, they're gonna win the war on talent. They're gonna perform well. Um, and companies that give an opportunity for their employees to participate in their communities have a higher propensity of tenure. So I understand that and I hear that. I, I think that the more mainstream this becomes though, it's not a trade-off. It's just looking at a good solid investment. And these are, you know, whether or not you're an oil and gas company, um, you know, or a recycling company that's doing good in the world, if you take those fundamental ESG priorities and those companies are doing well, they're solid investments. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think we all get that. Tyler, I would ask you, though, as you're consulting with your clients, are they doing this because they don't want to be the villain of tomorrow and they want to check the box or, or do is their heart in it? I think that's what we you know, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? And once again, it's a yeah. journey. So I know at yep. the beginning of the journey, it's like, I don't want to be the poster child. Yep. And now we're further along where we have the rigor uh, and the analytics that says, look, companies who do these things perform better. But what are you seeing from your clients? Sure. I, I would just say that particularly for those folks that are engaged in these conversations and in some cases are you know, pioneering as it relates to the investment strategy, I think they're, it's important to them. They're passionate about it and they want to understand and be involved you know, beyond, again, just uh, the financial aspects of what's going into an investment strategy. Uh, the one thing that I would add as it relates to, you know, we kind of think of it as the ESG and impact continuum. And, and just briefly, I would go, you know, maybe going left to right, I would think of it as, you know, traditional investment where you're not necessarily taking any of, the, any of these items into consideration to um, a more negatively based screen 
methodology where you're again not investing in certain parts of the market or companies to where i see esg really today it's, it's more integrated you know fundamentally integrated in how you make investment decisions when you move a little bit further on that continuum into areas that we would call you know impact investing or philanthropy th there is a point somewhere along that continuum where you're willing to say i i'm willing to accept a lower return or i'm willing to possibly forego a financial return for the greater good and so when you get to those areas, those tend to be, I would say, more focused on um, social and environmental areas and, and especially in um, private investment markets, but where folks really are willing to, uh, to, to make that trade off. And I think, uh, especially when you're getting into that arena and those types of conversations, it, it's clearly a substantial priority for folks. I mean, that, that, that's core to what they're doing. So uh, that's one thing that we've seen. Okay, that's fair. So, so let me ask you then, if you think about ESG, uh, as this kind of holistic approach and framework, and you had to weight them in terms of where you see the energy, where you see the dialogue. Is it on the E? Is it on the S? Is it on the G? And I know that that could change over time. I mean, we've seen a lot of energy around the S recently, right? So what, what are you seeing with your clients? Yeah, I, I would reiterate that. I mean, I think E is very clear earnest, like it's a little bit more tangible for people. Um, S tends to be, to some extent, um, not episodic, but obviously there's more interest in that when things like the death of George Floyd and social activism is at the forefront. Um, but that's even going to mean different things in different geographies to some extent, right? Um, so there's that piece of it. I do also think though, kind of to Tyler's point, I just wanted to dovetail on what he said before is like, you know, this is ESG, but it's also values-based investing. So where are my values and can I line my investments with those values? So they, someone could have a value that's not even within the normal sphere of what we're thinking about ESG. You know, we have clients who care um, about um, international causes, right? And they want to invest in entrepreneurs in different countries because that's something that they're passionate about. Like that impact investing notion is very interesting. So I just, I wanted to kind of lean in on that a little bit because that customization and meeting clients where they're at, there can definitely be um, some different levels of interest and importance of ESG on a given day, but that there's outliers of that too, which can be very individualized. Okay, excellent, excellent point that you're making there. All right, let me go to some specific questions and I'll read these verbatim. I don't wanna lose any of the flavor. Uh, let me start with Priya's question. Uh, which says, look, after George Floyd's murder several months ago, many organizations have decided to move forward with going uh, more external activism to fight for social justice, racial equality, such as taking external political stance, donations to relevant organizations. Do you think this has had a significant impact? Um, and um, for those that are choosing investment opportunities, if so, how would you describe that impact? Yeah, I'll start on that. I think that, you know, it, it, it really forces people to look again at those issues that they care about. Um, you know, do you want to invest in companies that have a high propensity of diversity on their board and in their senior leadership? Do you want to invest in companies that have policies that align with um, social issues that are happening in the world? Do you want to be more activist yourself? Um, in some of those areas. And I've been really impressed with the organizations like As You Sow, it's a nonprofit. They actually teach individuals how to research on their own different qualities within environmentalism to social justice within organizations. Um, and then you have you know, big institutional type of investors that are saying, wow, we're gonna start to ask these questions now. You know, Maybe we're talking about the E before, but we're gonna start talking about inclusion. We're gonna ask companies that we're investing in what their policies and practices are. Um, so so I, I think it's a great moment. Actually, it's not a moment, it's a movement uh, to your point around it being a journey. Um, and, I, and I do see not necessarily the political stance, I think that's important, but if you think about how you can be an investor in this space, and then you think about how companies then are also using their philanthropic capital to make a difference, um, it, it's, it's an exciting time, Ernest. So, you know, maybe just really quickly on the philanthropic piece, um, you know, William Blair established a three to one match um, for social equity 
uh, in May, um, which was very different and impactful for us to channel um, resources there. Um, and we've started to initiate our own talent relationships with organizations like the Greenwood Project to escalate and quite honestly, um, increase at a higher pace than the industry was providing a pipeline of diverse talent. So I, I do think that this has had some significant impact on multiple levels. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the transparency and candor uh, on that. Uh, we've all been impacted by COVID-19. Our colleague Daniel asked here, uh, what have you seen in terms of an impact uh, on corporate social responsibility uh, at William Blair? How, how has COVID impacted this world it seems like there's no area that's been untouched, but uh, are there some things that maybe we haven't thought of that uh, this is really touched on? And I'm happy to add to that, Laura, but I know CSR is near and dear if, if you wanted to start there. Yeah, I mean, I think with COVID, what we saw right away was just this desire to help. You know, I mean, it, it was fascinating. I think there was a little bit of concern that there would be stagnation perhaps, um, I mean, we were all together at Granger in 2007 and 2008, um, and, and things kind of halted. There was a paralysis. I did not see that in COVID. We were very worried philanthropically um, that dollars wouldn't be there to be investing in. I, I think there's been statistics that philanthropy has exploded over the past um, nine months in particular. Um, so that, that has been really uh, reassuring and exciting, and I'm hopeful for the trends. There's this interesting dichotomy right now where um, COVID is, we're looking very globally. We've become more global, I think, as um, investors and citizens. But then there's this like hyper local view too. Like, how do we help our neighbors? How do we help the business down the street, the restaurant, the first responder? Um, so I think COVID has uh, inspired um, activation. I think George Floyd has inspired activism, um, but I'm, I'm very hopeful. And we've seen, you know, great statistics around how this has really incited people to get more involved. Okay. Tyler, I want to come to you with this. Uh, this was an anonymous uh, attendee that here uh, that's here, and, and they're dealing with a fundamental um, precept or hypothesis they have. They said, if our company competes with other companies in our sector, that are not embracing ESG, on its face, we become non-competitive perhaps on profit performance. How can we communicate the value to customers to provide our halo effect on our purposeful long-term responsibility that maintains market share, perhaps get a premium price and more loyalty? Otherwise, there's a herd mentality by sector until behavior changes in the category or regulated by the government. I think it's this conundrum that we're finding ourselves in. What would you say to them, Tyler? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say from an investor standpoint, the one thing that we're seeing continued development, and I would say a microscope on is, is really a, you know, that fundamental um, understanding of the business. And I think that um, you know, the simple kind of financial metrics or traditional financial metrics through which uh, you know, one may assess a, a business, I think that will continue to be important, of course. But I think it's more of an and conversation that we're seeing play out. So to give an example of that, um, you know, some leading investment managers are having those, you know, having those dialogues. And I think particularly from an investor relations standpoint to really understand not only where business is to today, but to trajectory of that business going forward. And so I think part of it is being able to um, articulate and measure and um, improve that over time. But the one thing that, that we would expect to see, especially as it relates to um, you know, you know, the public markets, is there's going to be uh, a focus on that arena. And I think as you have more activism and dialogue and understanding of, of where business is, not only today, but where are they going? Are they leading in environmental matters? Are they, um, are they transparent in social issues? Are they um, out in front as it relates to developing and maintaining corporate culture? So I, I, I do agree that there's nuance in that. And sometimes I think the one challenge as it relates to ESG in particular is not everything is, is just readily apparent. So I think, you know, the availability of information, the data is fantastic. But even, even with all of that information as, is, as it is today, there's still more. And I think just taking kind of on face value, just those things is, is, is still not enough. So I think that's where there's still an opportunity for growth and, and further understanding. Okay. 
Thank you so much for that. Uh, I got a question here from Caleb and Laura. It was on the point that you made around trying to integrate ESG. So you got the PR function, the IR function, you got internal communications functions. Uh, but many times in the companies, the reality is they're working in silos. So, you know, how do you get them to integrate across the enterprise? What are you guys doing at William Blair that, that others could use to really help bring this uh, all together, whether it's with your channels or just the various groups? Um, you know, so, so please uh, answer yeah, that. Yeah, it, it's a little practical, but um, we have a cross-dysfunctional working group. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a cross-functional working group, but we actually, Tyler and I are both a part of it, but we, we actually bring together monthly leaders from each of our departments, um, central services, as well as the actual businesses. So when I talked about banking before, research, private wealth, man private wealth management, institutional wealth management, um, and, and even just having that cadence of us all getting together and talking about what we're doing and what the challenges are, what our learnings are, what progress we're making. Um, yes, we're all, we all to some extent are siloed by nature of our jobs, but that, that function of the working group and then the working group then interacting with our executive committee around our process and priorities has been a really effective way to break some of those silos down. Thank you. All right. I'm sorry, guys. I only have time for two more questions and I have uh, a whole lot left, uh, but let me try to get a, a more broad brush a couple to end us off on. Uh, first of all, uh, one of the questions here from Deborah Cefalio, she said, look, for companies who are working to improve their ESG, there's a lot of competing reporting out there and frameworks that you consider. You've mentioned one, uh, SASB, uh, there's GRI, there's TCFD, there are all these things out there. What advice would you have for these companies, these professionals that are trying to make headway, but it's just, it's just a lot, it's overwhelming. Yeah, I, I would say first and foremost, and I, I think just to kind of set the table, the one thing that we do see and that we're aware of is, again, just using kind of the um, public equity markets as an example, is you tend to see larger businesses that have um, more resources, bandwidth, um, really dedicated uh, folks that are able to help with measurement and delivery of that information. And, and then for that reason, you know, when you look at, you know, just ESG strategies broadly, and this is, a, again, a generalization, you tend to see a, a little bit of a tilt towards those larger businesses. And part of it is because, you know, for small companies and for even medium-sized companies, it's harder to really dedicate, you know, the resources bandwidth to, to ramp up to that same degree. So, you know, we're hoping over time that that gap continues to close. My, my thought on that would be to um, to take one step at a time. I mean, I think, you know, going back to the whole concept of journey earlier, I think that's what we've seen, you know, as, as a private business. And, uh, you know, Laura mentioned our cross-functional working group. I think it's taking one step at a time and, and trying to have success and make progress. Uh, because I, I think otherwise, when you look at everything that's out there as it is today, it can be overwhelming in some ways. So I think it's it, it's a matter of making progress and executing on one step as at a time, at a time as it makes sense for your business. And we're seeing a little bit more collaboration in that area, Ernest. Um, you know, where CDP and GRI and SASB are aligning on standards, and um, we recently became members of SASB. We actually applied materiality to who we were partnering with. If you think about FASB and SASB, it makes sense for financial services firms. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think we're going to get to a place of, of better integration amongst those entities that are rating and then perhaps companies are trying to align to. But that notion of materiality, I think, also makes sense for when you're thinking about what to report to. Like if you're a heavy um, carbon producer, you should be aligning to CDP and GRI. If you're in the financial services area or maybe taking an earlier approach to Reporting. I mean, SASB is just a great starting point, um, and they're, they're they're really practical. So um, we are starting to see some alignment, and I think some promise there. And and I have to say, like, take advantage of your academic institutions. Um, we worked with the University of Chicago, sorry, um, Booth students, and they actually came in and did an assessment of our ESG for a whole semester and aligned it for us to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and it was just an excellent exercise both for the students and for William Blair to have that perspective. And, and at the end of the day, we decided not to 
um, aligned to the SDGs holistically, but it was a great exercise to evaluate that framework. Great. And uh, so we look forward to a group coming out to help you from uh, Medill as well from IMC. Uh, last question. I, I know we got plenty and guys, I apologize. We couldn't get to all of them. Uh, but Jane has a question that ties into uh, a, a section that Nancy and I did on targeting. So how are you guys actively seeking new investors who are focused on ESG? You know, how do you segment them? How do you target them? Can you give us a little insight on that? Right. I would just start and, and say from a from a private wealth management construct. So the way that we think about our business is it's very much entrepreneurial. So it's it's in some ways a business of businesses. So we have you know financial advisors that are that are managing their practices within the William Blair um, ecosystem, and uh, our our group obviously works with you know those teams broadly. But um, we have practices that are that are really dedicated and focused on that core objective and understanding priorities and purpose of capital and delivering investment strategies customized to that exact experience. And um, so Laura, I think you probably have some additional uh, things to tie in there because you've been closely involved with some of those families we've worked with. But, but I would say very much so that we have folks that are, you know, that really have built their business around um, servicing clients in that way. Sorry, I'm hitting on mute. I, I think Tyler is exactly right on. I think where we've had a lot of success in attracting impact investors and um, just investors at large in this space, Ernest is kind of starting with the conversation of what do you care about, right? And in my space, it's relatively easy because if I'm working with a client who is philanthropically inclined, I know, for instance, if they're funding, you know, life sciences, if they're prioritizing um, diversity and funding equity, if they are funding women's initiatives, I would definitely direct them towards gender lens type investment strategies. But it really kind of starts with less of here's ESG, what do you want to invest in? And more, what do you care about? And what are your priorities? And to Tyler's point, what I love about our model is that flexibility to find things. I mean, we had a client um, who we've been talking a lot about equities and companies, but they wanted a fixed income ESG strategy and, and we built it for them um, using some of that fundamental analysis that we talked about. So I think when the conversation starts with what do you care about? And then you present to clients, you know, what the opportunities are for investment. Um, you know, we had another client that wanted to make a, a grant to an organization, but we actually flipped it around and it ended up being a loan. Um, and so when you can start with the question of what do you care about, then we can come with a lot of uh, creative options, I think, for them from an investment perspective. Guys, thank you so much for your transparency and for the knowledge that, that you shared with us today. Nancy, back to you. Uh, and I want to also add my thanks because uh, you guys have done a fantastic job of actually humanizing what I think people uh, wonder about, which was the question we had, investors as change agent. Are you kidding? And the reality is we have two change agents among a lot of change agents at I'm sure William Blair and other places that are helping make ESG important in the investment world. And, um, and I think that, that uh, the, the correct term is it is a journey. We have to keep, keep on our, our journey because we're making an impact. And that is the, the important thing. Uh, clearly environmental is, has, is perhaps further ahead on that. Um, this year social has made huge um, awareness and strides, um, but I think governance is perhaps the one that we, didn't really address, but I see that as being so tied up with the culture of an organization. And so I, I really want to thank you guys for all that you've done. And um, with that, I think we've pretty much come to the end of it. Uh, Vijay, would you like to say a few words? Uh, just quickly to wrap it up. Thanks so much. This was such a wonderful conversation. Definitely piqued my interest. And I'm eager to learn more about this. And it's fascinating to know that these efforts can be quantified and you can actually hold companies accountable. So thank you so much. Um, this is a great way to kick off the fall quarter for IMC events. So thank you so much again, Tyler and uh, Laura. Hope to engage you uh, more in the future and know more about this topic. So thanks once again. And thanks to everyone who attended it. Great to see uh, alumni and students and staff. So thank you so much.